So this week we begin a four-week study in epistemology. What is true and how do you know? Although our study of truth and knowledge will last four weeks, each week will not work the same. We begin by taking a noticeably deeper step than weeks prior in order to focus this week on the problem of skepticism, a lot of the questions raised concerning knowledge, and the terminology that we need to be able to wade through as we explore the depths of the issues. If you find this week to be particularly tough, hang in there. For the next two weeks, we move on to the historical debate concerning the issue. And so we will be focusing more on ideas uh, at particular points in history. And then in the fourth week, we will be tying things up and considering a few last issues as they affect contemporary thinking. So our driving question for the next four weeks will be, how do you know that you know what you think you know that you know? Or how do you know that you really know when you just know that you know what you know? You know? In the 2016 film Trolls, there's a scene in which Poppy, the protagonist, is trying to make the case that the Bergens do not have to eat the trolls. To this, one of the trolls replies, but you have to eat trolls to be happy. Everybody knows that. Of the things that you know, how many of those things do you really know? Of what are you absolutely certain? If there are any things of which you are absolutely certain, how do you know that you know those things? Can you account reasonably for your beliefs? Or do you believe some things groundlessly? Maybe because the culture sold it to you. Maybe because you grew up believing that and haven't questioned it. Maybe because it feels right or seems right to you, but you never really stop to ask why. I thought it would be fun and appropriate to begin with something that I discovered by accident a couple of years ago when I was preparing some resource material for my applied ethics course. You know, one of the buzz phrases in our culture today is misinformation. It's a big deal. But when it comes to the problem of knowledge, the problem is not just misunderstanding facts or misreporting facts. Many times the problem involves what we can know or what we do know about the facts, as well as the logic and reasoning which we apply to that data when we say that it is correctly reported or misinformed data. Even reputable sources make mistakes. Even good thinkers have bad ideas. And even when we know how to read information, that doesn't mean that we can't make mistakes. So here we have a, a website by the BBC, and it spotlights ethical issues that are presented in a bite-sized manner, or a manner that is easy enough to understand, to chew on, and take with you. Here, the BBC is addressing euthanasia, the question of whether the deliberate ending of a life, for compassionate reasons, is ever justifiable. On this website, they give you some really interesting data. Cases in the Netherlands have doubled. The issue is related to a number of suicides. And then this is really interesting. 82% of religious and non-religious people support euthanasia. Can you believe that? You would think it would probably be less since it's such a controversial issue. Wow. Well, how do we get that number? Well, they show you. 82% comes from the 46% of non-religious people who support it and the 36% of religious people who support it. So there you go. You're welcome to your opinion, but if you believe that euthanasia is wrong, well, you're in the minority. And some might pressure you here and say that you're on the wrong side of, of compassion or progress or whatever. But look at that data. Is that right? 46% of non-religious people and 36% of religious people. So 82% of people, because religious people and non-religious people together, that's everybody, right? So this would mean 
that 82% of people, of course, there is the question of the, the data poll, you know, how many people were surveyed. I mean, that's a, a fair question, but that's not the issue here. That is worth considering. 82% of the sample that was surveyed does not accurately represent 82% of everyone in the world who would ponder the issue. But that's beside the point. Look at the data. How do you get 82? You get 82 from adding 46 and 36. Okay. How are you supposed to get averages? You add the two together. Oh, fair enough. 46 and 36 is 82. Oh, but that's not the end of it, right? Once you add 0.36 and 0.46 and you get 0.82, you're supposed to divide by the two groups. Then you get 41. So it's not true that the majority of people support euthanasia. It's actually true that less than 50% support it. That's a completely different result. So if you were to take something like this and go around saying, look, here's what I know and here's how I know it. This is a reputable source. The BBC has given me my information and I can tell you that the majority of people support this. You should too. If you don't, you're probably wrong. Well, how do you know what you know, you know, in this case, do you know the correct information? And do you know that your source had the correct information? Before we dive into the problems of knowledge concerning the truth of reality, let's start by considering three main approaches to describing reality. Those three possibilities are describing reality as an abyss, a matrix, or a cave. Another way of putting it is matterism, it's all about matter, mindism, it's all about mind, or dualism, it somehow involves both. First, consider an abyss. In this case, we're describing ultimate meaning or truth as nothingness. If the physical stuff is all that there is, and we are just here as the product of chance and happenstance, we find ourselves here and we stare into an abyss. There is no point in reaching for knowledge because there's nothing there to know. If all that is, is the physical stuff, and the physical stuff is in a state of decay, nothing is permanent. And if the physical stuff came from chance and happenstance, there is no ultimate purpose. There is no ultimate meaning for your life. There is no ultimate identity for you. There is no way it should be. Beyond the physical, nothing is. Whereas the matter only or materialist view says that nothing is except the physical, that we see and experience. Another view would say nothing is as it seems to be because everything that we experience is actually an illusion. If you've ever seen the 1999 film, The Matrix, that would describe this view. In this case, nothing that we experience is as it is. Our experience is real. We are here and we do experience, but everything that we experience might as well be like data programming in a computer. We are just experiencing the software that was put there from somewhere else. Or on this view, suppose that you are just a brain. That's all you are. You're a brain in a vat. And your brain is being stimulated in such a way with electrical impulses that it creates these sensations and these thoughts within you and these sensual experiences that are connected to your mental experience. Everything that you think you know and sense in the world is real. That is, you really experience it. And yet, nothing that you experience is actually real because it's not as you think it is. It's all an illusion. Note in both of these cases, matterism and mindism, if you will, reality is only one kind of stuff. That is, our experience of reality is only one kind of stuff. On the materialism view or materialist view, there is only the physical stuff, that which we experience, 
sensually is all there is. On the view of mindism, which actually goes by the name idealism, there are only ideas. Our experience is real, our mental experience is real, but at the end of all things, reality is connected to a mind, not to the physical world. And this could involve a number of views. It could be the case that all that exists is one big mind, and we are all little experiences within that mind. There's only a mind. It could be the case that God exists and created minds, and all we are are minds, but we have a rich mental life that thinks there's more going on. On this view, our experience of reality is ultimately one kind of thing. It's mental. The physical stuff doesn't exist, except within our mind. There is another view that we've been considering for two weeks now. In this case, we see things as they are. There is a physical world. It's not an illusion. And yet, there is also much more beyond the physical world, even though we cannot interact with it in the same way as we interact with the physical world. So in a sense, we see through a glass darkly, but we do sense that there are other higher truths. And these things are knowable. This, of course, is the Platonic view. And last week, we looked more closely at the analogy of the cave. We understand now that the cave represents the material world. That's the matterism view or the materialist view. And the upstairs is the world of ideas or the mindism view, whereas the first two views say there's only this and nothing beyond, or there's only this and the downstairs is not real. The dualist view, which sees our experience of reality like a cave rather than an abyss or a matrix, holds that reality is composed of both material and immaterial stuff and the material stuff is real and the immaterial stuff can be known. In fact, it's more important since the stuff down here is changing and the stuff up there is changed less. It's the stuff up there that gives meaning to the down here. Now, Plato's allegory teaches us at least two things. First, all of the things which we take to be the most real, they're right here before us. These are actually only shadows of a much greater degree of reality. In the same way that a dream can seem real, when in fact there is a much greater degree of reality that exists beyond the dream world. The second thing that Plato's allegory teaches us is that philosophy is liberating but also painful. It is liberating to acquire deeper understanding. Any student that has been wrestling with that material for weeks feels good about themselves and better about the material once it finally makes sense. That's when learning becomes fun, right? But just because we are able to understand the general nature of reality and knowledge deeper than before, this in itself does not mean that we really understand reality and knowledge. This is why we should devote our lives to becoming a student of wisdom. Moreover, communicating about knowledge can be just as painful as its acquisition. Remember, it's a painful thing coming out of the cave. The strength training to be able to look toward the light is a painful process, but that's only half of the journey. The other half involves coming back down into the cave and trying to communicate with the people who have never left the cave. It can be frustrating to try to put concepts that don't fit into the cave into a cave dweller's language. And it can also be frustrating to be confident that you have a deeper understanding and to be passionate about sharing that with someone, yet to be ridiculed for pretending to know things that you don't. Even worse, to be crazy for believing in that kind of stuff. So what is truth? There are different perspectives on truth, but they all pretty much fall into one of two broad categories. You are either some form of epistemic realist or an epistemic relativist. Now remember, epistemology is the study of knowledge, the study of truth and knowledge, so epistemic has to do with knowledge. An epistemic realist or epistemic realism 
holds that knowledge refers to objective universal truths. Something is objective, we can all know it. It's universal, it's a truth that applies to all people, wherever they are. So epistemic realists believe in objective universal truths, and some may even stress the significance of absolute truths. According to the different camps of epistemic relativism, however, knowledge is either subjective, truth is determined by the individual, or it is conventional, it's the product of the conventions of the culture. So on epistemic relativism, truth depends on one's conceptual framework. There is no real truth, then. There is only a multitude of perspectives. Since, as Protagoras claimed, man is the measure of all things, human beings are the standard of all truths. And so it is futile to search for fixed standards of knowledge out there beyond us. There is a problem for relativists, however. Relativism faces the problem of self-referential absurdity. To say there is no truth is a contradiction. Because the moment that you say there is no truth, you have asserted a statement, a proposition about reality. And propositions about reality are either true or false. It's either the case that what you say is true when you say there is no truth, or it's not the case. And if it is the case that you are correct, there is no truth, then if that statement is right, it proves you wrong. For that view to be correct, relativism must fail. The denial of truth is an assertion of truth. Let's look at the theories of truth. The first stands in stark contrast to the others. The others overlap. According to the correspondence theory of truth, this was Aristotle's view and the primary view throughout the majority of history, a proposition is true if and only if it corresponds to the way things actually are. So truth is that which corresponds to reality. On the coherence theory of truth, however, a proposition is true if and only if it coheres with the set of beliefs that a person holds. So as long as it works with our other beliefs, we're justified in calling it truth. If, as an individual, I'm trying to figure out what I know, the correspondence theory would say, if my claims on knowledge correspond to the way things actually are in the real world, beyond me, then I have truth. I'm justified in saying that my claim to knowledge is true. On the coherence theory of truth, I might assert a claim on knowledge, and it might be the case that it does not actually correspond to the way things are. However, I have no knowledge of that fact. What I do know is that my belief about this, that is my claim to knowledge about this, does not contradict or cause problems with any other view that I hold or belief or claim to knowledge that I hold. Therefore, all of my beliefs work together, they cohere, so I'm justified in my claim to truth or knowledge, even if my claim does not actually match up to the way things are. My claim to truth coheres with my network of other beliefs, therefore I'm justified in my claim to truth. The pragmatic theory of truth holds that a proposition is true if and only if it is useful to the believer in achieving desirable results. So the catchphrase here is, if it works for us, then it's true. In the words of the famous neo-pragmatist Richard Rorty, truth is whatever our peers let us get away with saying. So as we progress and we gain more knowledge, we have new ideas of what truth might look like, just as science is in the business of not declaring an ultimate forever truth that cannot be challenged, but asserting as truth that which seems to be the best explanation. And if new evidence arises, then science modifies the theory. So to this scientific theory of truth, the pragmatic theory of truth, 
says truth is whatever works for us. If we come across some new information in the future and we need to modify our definitions of value and morality or whatever, we'll modify and move from there. We have no problem changing our definitions or defining values and morality as we go along because there is no truth beyond us in our definitions. Truth is whatever we say it is. As long as everyone agrees and we're all on the same page and it seems to work, then that is what truth means. The position of relativism falls into the two camps of individual or social. The subjectivist holds that truth is personal, or truth is individual. So I have my truth, you have your truth. Truth is an individual construction. This would be like Protagoras' statement, man is the measure of all things. On the other hand, we also have the conventional form of relativism, sometimes called cultural relativism. And this is the view that truth is the product of social construction. So if you do you, is the catchphrase for the subjectivist, then when in Rome, do as the Romans do, might be the catchphrase for the conventionalist. Truth is whatever each culture determines for itself. There is no real truth beyond law. There is no ultimate overarching truth binding on everyone. There is no way it ought to be, or things like that. Regardless of which theory you believe to be the most convincing, Recall this week's nagging question. How do you know that you know what you think you know? In every theory, there is room for doubt. The question becomes, what do you do with the doubt? Skepticism is the view that we have no knowledge or that we are significantly limited in our knowledge. And there are two broad camps. Academic or radical skepticism holds that it is impossible for your sensual impressions, your sense experience, to give you knowledge about the world. This is an assertion that nothing can be known. All of our knowledge comes from sense experience. It's impossible for our sensual impressions to give us knowledge. Therefore, we cannot have real knowledge. So nothing can ever be really known. At best, we can speak of our experience at the moment. Pyrrhonian skepticism, named after the ancient Greek Pyrrho, refuses to advance any arguments at all, even the argument that knowledge is impossible. Academic skepticism is an assertion that nothing can be known, while Pyrrhonian skepticism is an absolute suspension of belief because there is no basis for holding any one position over another. Now, to be clear in our language, you could be skeptical about many things. You could believe that there are higher truths, there is a way it's supposed to be, things like that, and still, on certain beliefs or certain worldviews, be skeptical about those things. Uh, you could even be within one thought tradition and be skeptical about some of the claims to knowledge within that tradition. So to be a skeptic, to be skeptical or critical of certain ideas, that can be applied in many different ways. So it's, it's important to understand that right now we're talking about ultimate knowledge. When we try to figure out if anything that we claim to know about the world can actually be known, this sort of epistemic skepticism, skeptic about knowledge itself, falls into these two camps. Now, you could be an agnostic and just say, well, I'm not sure where I stand at the moment on these theories of truth or skepticism. I need to think it over a little bit more. But if you're an epistemic skeptic, then you think either there is no knowledge to know or we can't know it if there is. That would be the academic skeptic. Or even if we were right, we would have no reason to know that we were right. We would have no basis for claiming one truth over another. We do not have enough knowledge to justify asserting one truth over another. Now, they sound very similar, but the difference is the Peronian realizes what some would say is a problem for the academic. That is, when you say you know 
that nothing can be known, well, that's an assertion of knowledge. The academic might be comfortable saying that, but the Peronian is not. That's a claim to knowledge. I don't think any claims to knowledge can be made. Therefore, I will even refrain from asserting that nothing can be known. Now, let's think about this for a few moments. So I call this the circle of skepticism. So we begin our philosophical journey, realizing that there is much that we don't know and seeking answers. We begin to rise with our inquiry, seeking questions, believing truth to be there, to be known. We begin to find truth, so we think, and, and find answers and acquire knowledge, so we believe, and then we are feeling good about ourselves and, and um, encouraged to continue in our journey, but eventually we come across a point of friction or tension. Something rubs us the wrong way. We don't know how to respond. It shakes us up a bit. Why think I have the right answer? Why would I think that my way is the right way? And we begin to become less confident and we begin to doubt. And the doubt brings us right back to a state of uncertainty where either we try to find answers and start the journey again, or we decide to become skeptical that anything could be known. And this can really happen regardless of your worldview. For example, there was a guy in the Middle Ages. This was a rich time for exploring arguments for the existence of God. And so there was a theologian. He believed in God. He's familiar with these arguments. And yet theologizing, he says, you know, if there's a God who is all powerful, wouldn't he be powerful enough to be able to make me think that I see this tangerine on the table when in fact I don't? Now, that's a powerful question. Think about it. If there is a God who is all-powerful, is he not, would he not be powerful enough to be able to make you think you see the world as you currently believe yourself to see it, when in fact there is no physical world there for you to see? All that you think you experience is just in your mind? Isn't that possible? That God did not make a physical material world, but he made a bunch of minds and gave them such a rich inner cognitive life that they believe themselves to be acquiring knowledge. And maybe God even had some kind of connecting between minds so that we are aware of one another's presence. Maybe we are even able to communicate about what we see because what's going on in our mind is somehow shared between minds. And so just like the shadows on the wall, we are able to talk about these things of which we are so certain when in fact, maybe we're just the minds talking about the inner mental experiences that we believe to be physical. So there's a lot of ways that you can find yourself facing doubt. Can you prove that the world is more than five minutes old? Is it not possible that the world was created five minutes ago with all of the appearance that it currently has, and we were created at this stage of maturity in our life with all of the memories about the things we think we've already experienced implanted within us so that we believe ourselves to have been living much longer than five minutes ago. And yet all of that inner cognitive life, all of that mental experience was created along with the world five minutes ago. Is it possible? If you don't believe it is, could you prove that it's not? How would you do so? There are many ways to wander into doubt. And sometimes the doubt may be uncertainty that we can justify our beliefs. Or sometimes it might simply be a doubt that we acknowledge but doesn't necessarily bother us. If you cannot prove the world is older than five minutes, does that bother you? Let's have a little more fun with this. How do you know? You're not dreaming right now. Some dreams seem really real. How would you know that this was not just one of those times in which a dream seems very real when in fact you're just dreaming? How would you know if you were in the matrix? Unless someone brought it to your attention that you were in a virtual computer world, how would you know that you were? If you couldn't know that you were, you had no reason for suspecting it, then how do you know you're not? How do you know you are not a robot? How do you know you're not an artificial intelligence programmed specifically to believe that you are a human being? 
Could you prove that this is not the case? How do you know that you are not just a brain in a vat being stimulated in such and such a way so as to create this inner cognitive life, these experiences which you believe yourself to be having? How could you prove that is not the case? Because you feel pain? Because you feel pleasure? Do you think that could really do it? Let's have some more fun with this. Are zombies real? How do you know that people in your neighborhood are not zombies? Well, because they don't look like this, right? But who says they have to? Harvard professor of psychiatry Stephen Schlossman supposes that perhaps zombies function more like crocodiles. They may not be conscious in the same way humans are, but they are aware of surroundings and they respond to their environments. So I think the zombies have to be covered in blood, stumbling around and trying to eat any flesh they come across. Maybe they look more like us, they just don't function in the same way, at the same level. Maybe they just kind of stare and move about. Have you ever come across people that just have a blank stare on their face, as if the lights just aren't on inside? Could these guys be zombies? Suppose there are mutants. Not like these, that would be awesome. But why think mutants have to look like this? What if there are people who feel pain when they see blue, or laughter and pleasure whenever they are stabbed with needles? What if one hears yellow and smells purple? Is that a category error? Imagine a world in which you see numbers and letters as colored, even though they're printed in black. In which music or voices trigger a swirl of moving colored shapes. In which words and names fill your mouth with unusual flavors. Jail tastes like cold, hard bacon, while Derek tastes like earwax. Welcome to Synesthesia, the neurological phenomenon that couples two or more senses in 4% of the population. A synesthete might not only hear my voice, but also see it, taste it, or feel it as a physical touch. Sharing the same root with anesthesia, meaning no sensation, synesthesia means joint sensation. Having one type, such as colored hearing, gives you a 50% chance of having a second, third, or fourth type. One in 90 among us experience graphemes, the written elements of language like letters, numerals, and punctuation marks, as saturated with color. Some even have gender or personality. For Gail, three is athletic and sporty. Nine is a vain, elitist girl. By contrast, the sound units of language, or phonemes, trigger synesthetic tastes. For James, college tastes like sausage, as does message in similar words with the idge ending. Synesthesia is a trait, like having blue eyes, rather than a disorder, because there's nothing wrong. In fact, all the extra hooks endow synesthetes with superior memories. For example, a girl runs into someone she met long ago. Let's see, she had a green name. These are green. Deborah, Darby, Dorothy, Denise. Yes, her name is Denise. Once established in childhood, pairings remain fixed for life. Synesthetes inherit a biological propensity for hyperconnecting brain neurons, but then must be exposed to cultural artifacts such as calendars, food names, and alphabets. The amazing thing is that a single nucleotide change in the sequence of one's DNA alters perception. In this way, synesthesia provides a path to understanding subjective differences, how two people can see the same thing differently. Take Sean, who prefers blue-tasting foods such as milk, oranges, and spinach. The gene heightens normally occurring connections between the taste area in his frontal lobe and the color area further back. But suppose in someone else that the gene acted in non-sensory areas. You'd then have the ability to link seemingly unrelated things, which is the definition of metaphor, seeing the similar in the dissimilar. Not surprisingly, synesthesia is more common in artists who excel at making metaphors, like novelist Vladimir Nabokov, painter David Hockney, and composers Billy Joel and Lady Gaga. But why do the rest of us non-synesthetes understand metaphors like sharp cheese or sweet person? 
It so happens that sight, sound, and movement already map to one another so closely that even bad ventriloquists convince us that the dummy is talking. Movies, like Lloyd's, convince us that the sound is coming from the actors' mouths rather than surrounding speakers. So, inwardly, we're all synesthetes, outwardly unaware of the perceptual couplings happening all the time. Crosstalk in the brain is the rule, not the exception. And that sounds like a sweet deal to me. So the skeptical challenge is this. As long as there is reason to doubt, then I can never say that I know anything. Here it is in argument form. If there is a skeptical hypothesis, when we say skeptical hypothesis, we will mean any hypothesis or theory that could cast doubt upon any given belief. If there is a skeptical hypothesis for some belief P of mine, then I cannot claim to know P. There is a skeptical hypothesis for P, therefore I do not know P. To say it another way, if I can find a reason to doubt any given belief of mine, then I cannot claim to know that belief. I can find a reason to doubt, therefore I cannot claim to know. Or in the more extreme form, there is reason to doubt any given belief of mine. So I cannot claim to know anything. Historically, there have been two broad responses to this challenge, the rationalist response and the empiricist response. Rationalists claim that all knowledge ultimately comes to us through reason rather than sense experience. The empiricists disagree, however, insisting that all knowledge ultimately comes to us through sense experience. Here are three modern responses. Now, if you're not familiar with that terminology, historically, the modern era begins with the rise of the Enlightenment. So modernity, or the modern era, refers to roughly the 1600s through 1900. The early 1900s are called the modernist era, or modernism, and roughly the 1960s forward is referred to as the postmodern era, or postmodernism. So the skeptic would say that we cannot know that all we see is not just an illusion, and we have no good reason for believing otherwise. Here are three modern responses. According to the method of Rene Descartes, we should doubt all things, including the very notion that all that I see is just an illusion. In doubting all things, we are essentially taking our worldview apart, and like a puzzle, we are just dumping all the pieces on the floor, and then attempting to piece back together only those beliefs which are undeniably clear and distinct. So on the Cartesian way, I start by doubting all things. Then I consider what I can know. I can at least know that I am thinking and that I have a diversity of ideas in my mind. Most amazingly, I have an idea of an infinitely powerful God in mind. But infinite ideas cannot be produced by finite beings. Ideas must therefore come from God. Therefore, I can know that I exist and that God exists. And if God exists, I can trust that he is not tricking me by making me see something that's not there. According to Bertrand Russell, we should admit the possibility that perhaps our life is just a dream and then give reasons to doubt that option by showing that we have no good reason to suppose that. On the contrary, Trusting in common sense realism seems to be a simpler theory. According to the position known as Occam's razor, when you have multiple contending theories, you should go with the simplest explanation. So according to Russell, our common sense realism is a simpler theory than believing that everything we experience is just a dream or an illusion. Then there's the method of G.E. Moore. Who said, here's one hand, here's another. Hands are external to me, so there are external objects. Basic claims about particular things 
cannot be proved because there is nothing more basic to start from. If I was a brain in a vat, I could not know that I really had hands. But I do know I have hands, so I am not a brain in a vat. And here are some more contemporary responses. Some philosophers have given semantic arguments. These attempt to argue that radical skepticism self-destructs due to the very nature of language. The language of the skeptic presumes the existence of something in order to deny it. How do you know what you cannot know? So first of all, there's the presumption that the theory that all that we see is just an illusion can be known to be more reliable or more likely than any other contending theory. But second, more pointedly, there's the problem that we mentioned earlier. Anytime a skeptic says they know what cannot be known, they are asserting a claim on knowledge. Yet if it's true that knowledge cannot be acquired, then the knowledge that knowledge cannot be acquired could not be acquired. So there's a problem. According to the defense argument, Skepticism is seen to be a healthy aspect of philosophy, but it might be likened to an autoimmune disease, wherein a healthy thing is carried to an unhealthy end. Skepticism misleads us into presupposing that we must doubt something unless we are able to formulate a convincing argument in defense of that belief. We may not have good reason for believing in something, but this does not mean that we have good reason to doubt it. So the skeptical challenge is, if any belief P of mine can be doubted, then I do not know P. There is reason to doubt P, therefore I do not know P. But here's a question for you. Do we really need absolute certainty? It's important to keep in mind here that a rebuttal is not the same as a refutation. And a rebuttal shows that an opponent has not proven his or her view to be true. We should note that the skeptic has not really given us any reasons to believe that the skeptical hypothesis is true. For example, that we have reason to doubt that what we see is real, or we have reason to believe that all we see is just an illusion. The skeptic does not show that we are in a matrix or a dream world. She or he merely claims or suggests that we cannot rule it out. But why ought not the skeptic be the one to bear the burden of proof? Just because there is a skeptical hypothesis for my belief P that I cannot rule out, it does not necessarily follow that I have a reason to think that I do not know P. In actuality, we do not have absolute certainty about the majority of things that we claim. But don't be alarmed. Saying that a given belief or position is not absolutely certain need not commit us to saying that it is totally uncertain. So picture degrees of certainty. Let three represent something believed beyond all doubt. Let two represent that which is believed beyond a reasonable doubt. Let one stand for that which we believe to be more probable than not. And let zero represent a place where a belief seems equally as probable as it seems improbable. Notice that here at zero, we are not sure. We could take it or leave it. So only at level zero ought we to withhold a belief. Regardless of degrees, levels 1 through 3 all seem to suggest that we do have an obligation to believe in such a case. And again, level 0 means that something is as likely as unlikely. So it would take additional reasons to move into what we might call the negative zone, where negative 1 might represent that a belief seems more improbable than probable, etc. 